Well, last time we were reminded of Paul's love for his people, and let's not forget how important it is that we actually love the unbeliever. Uh, if we don't, we're not really going to make any efforts to reach out to them. But while he was in the temple, remember to show the believing Jews that he hadn't abandoned the Mosaic traditions, which is what they had heard. Uh, and remember, too, that a Jewish believer had the liberty, actually, to uh, keep these traditions under the gospel as long as he didn't begin to trust in those things to make him right to make him acceptable to God. There is nothing we can do to make ourselves acceptable to God. That's why we need to trust Jesus to make us acceptable. Well, while he was in the process of doing this, he was spotted by some Jews who had come from Asia for the feast, likely from Ephesus, where Paul had been ministering for some time. And when they saw him, they immediately grabbed him tried to turn the crowd against him, remember ironically by accusing him of preaching against the Jewish people, against the temple, and against the Mosaic traditions, which is really what he was there to show that he wasn't against, but also of bringing Greeks into the temple, again, none of which he was guilty of. They dragged him out of the temple, and while they were attempting to kill him, he was saved by a Roman tribune. And yet again, because of his great love for the Jewish people, for his own countrymen, Paul asked the tribune if he might speak to them. He so desperately wanted them to receive their Messiah, even though all they wanted to do was, was basically tear him to pieces. So having received the tribune's permission, he testified to them of God's grace. Now last week we saw they were patient up to the point where Jesus warned Paul that they, the Jews, would not listen and that he was intending to send them to the Gentiles. This morning we see the results. When Paul said this, the Jews reacted explosively. But what we want to see this morning is the Lord protected him. Protected him by giving him wisdom. First of all, by appealing to his Roman citizenship. And secondly, by appealing to what he had in common, what he held in common, those beliefs with the Pharisees. Now, he was simply doing what Jesus told his disciples they should do before he sent them out to teach and preach in the villages and towns around Galilee. He says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. What, what does that mean? Well, that, that's what we're, we're looking at this morning. Now, first we see Paul's appeal to his Roman citizenship to protect him. When Paul uh, told them, the Jews, that they would reject God's message, which would result in the gospel going out to the Gentiles, and let's not forget that that was really a part of God's plan. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11 that he was turning to the Gentiles in order to make the Jews jealous, and I, I would say that it worked, okay? Uh, they did become jealous when they heard about this. They became very agitated, so much so they cried out, for his death. Now let's not forget that Paul had been speaking to these Jews in Hebrew and apparently the Tribune didn't understand Hebrew. So he was still no closer to understanding why it was the Jews were so angry at him. And so he ordered Paul to be taken back to the barracks where he would discover what the problem was by scourging. Now remember scourging is a pretty pretty serious method of interrogation. One commentator writes this, the Roman scourge was a whip of leather thongs loaded with bits of metal or bone. It could maim for life or kill. Jesus was scourged with such a whip. Thus far, Paul has been beaten, but has never endured this severe punishment. Now, he might, I was thinking about what the commentator said here. He had, no, he hadn't endured scourging, at least up to this point. But he had been beaten by rods, he'd been stoned to death. I mean, there were many things that he had endured. So perhaps this doesn't to necessarily top the list. But it was a very severe punishment. But as the soldiers were binding him to the post, Paul turns to the centurion who was overseeing the process, and he asks, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned. Now, Roman citizens were protected by Roman law, 
Cicero, uh, the famous Roman statesman and orator, wrote this, quote, it is a heinous sin to bind a Roman citizen. It is wickedness to beat him. It is next to parricide, which means killing a parent or a close relative, to kill him. And what shall I say? To crucify him. Close quote. Matthew Henry writes this, The Romans had a law that if any magistrate did chastise or condemn a free man of Rome without hearing him speak for himself and deliberating upon the whole of his case, he should be liable to the sentence of the people who were very jealous of their liberties. As you can see, it's a very serious matter uh, to bind a Roman free man without proper trial and certainly to punish him. So when the centurion heard this, he immediately went to the tribune and the tribune came to Paul and asked him, tell me, are you a Roman? Paul answered, yes. The tribune said, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. Now, one commentator tells us this, Roman citizenship was bought and sold in the reign of Claudius, we know, at a high price, at a subsequent date for next to nothing. But to put in a false claim to this privilege was a capital crime. So if Paul said this falsely in order to avoid punishment, that alone would be worthy of, of being put to death. So the tribune knew that Paul would not say this lightly, but Paul claimed a still higher privilege. He said, but I was actually born a citizen. Now again, another writes this, Roman citizenship was highly prized, usually given only to those of a high position or those who had performed some valuable service to the state. It was then passed on to one's family, as in Paul's case, since he is a citizen by birth. So in other words, Paul didn't just purchase his citizenship. It was actually bestowed upon his family because his family had done something very honorable. Now, when those holding him heard that, they immediately let him go. The tribune was also afraid uh, when he realized what he had done because the consequences to him would be severe. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that Paul would say this for his own protection because he had the right not to be beaten by them in this way. But I think a more interesting question is why didn't Paul say something about this under other circumstances? For instance, when he was arrested for casting the demon out of the woman at Philippi. You know, uh, was it because they, they grabbed him too quickly? Um, they punished him too quickly, he didn't have time to raise the objection. Well, that doesn't really seem likely since he also chose to say nothing during the beating or even after the beating or while he was in prison at midnight and they were singing praises to God. It wasn't until they came to release him that they actually said something about it. Now, I think, I mean, how do we answer this question? Why does Paul on one occasion you know, use his Roman citizenship to, for protection and on another case he doesn't? It may be that Paul had some sense in, in all of these circumstances of what God's purpose was in, in these cases, what he was aiming at. I mean, think about the good things that came about because he didn't open his mouth in Philippi. His silence allowed him to bring the gospel to the Philippian jailer and his family, which resulted in their salvation. And of course, you know, the, the strengthening or the founding of the church at Philippi. I think when we were looking at this text, we also noted it served to protect the fact that he told them that he was a citizen after they had done this, served to protect the new church at Philippi, since the authorities might be afraid Paul would retaliate if they should reach out their hands and, and do something to injure the church. See, the fact that they did this to Paul meant that perhaps they shouldn't do that. Now here, it appears that he knows that the Lord was using these events to prepare to take him to Rome and that this flogging really wouldn't further that end. And so he chose to speak up on this occasion. I do think this is the wisdom that Jesus had earlier promised his disciples. He says in Luke 12, verses 11 and 12, 
when they bring you before the synagogues, which we're going to see in just a moment, and the rulers and the authorities, okay, which is happening now. Do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now, again, this is what Jesus means when he says, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Use the wisdom the Spirit of God gives you in those circumstances. Don't try to premeditate, try to figure it all out. The Spirit of God will teach you. Jameson, Fossett, and Brown write in their commentary, alone, the wisdom of the serpent is mere... The, the wisdom, excuse me. Um, okay, alone, the wisdom of the serpent is mere cunning. And the harmlessness of the dove, little better than weakness. But in combination, the wisdom of the serpent would save them from unnecessary exposure to danger. The harmlessness of the dove from sinful expedience to escape it. In the apostolic age of Christianity, how harmoniously were these qualities displayed? Instead of the fanatical thirst for martyrdom to which a later age gave birth, there was a manly combination of unflinching zeal and calm discretion before which nothing was able to stand. I hope you, you got the sense of what he was saying. Now, our Lord is telling us here that we don't need to suffer unnecessarily for the gospel. We're certainly not called, our, you know, called by him to throw ourselves to the lions. You know, that's what, um, again, uh, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown were referring to because some of the early Christians actually lined up to be torn apart by lions because they believed dying the death of a martyr was superior to dying in any other way. So they said, sign me up, I, I want to die, you know. No, it, what our Lord is telling us is it's wise to avoid suffering if we can without compromising the gospel and if we can do it without sinning. I mean, to deny Christ to get out of the punishment, no, we can't do that. But if there is a way we can avoid it, our Lord is telling us that we can as long as we don't compromise God's truth, as long as we don't compromise, again, our, our service to Him. Now, Paul's example also shows us, interestingly, that we can use the protection that our citizenship affords us as citizens, you know, um, when we're serving the Lord at home or abroad. Uh, if we are mobbed by a group of people, we can, you know, call upon the government to protect us, to, to perhaps save us. Perhaps we can appeal if we're put in jail unjustly, if we're in another country and we're serving the Lord we can you know, appeal to the consulate and our citizenship to help get us out of difficulty. You know, I think this example tells us that we are able to use the government for protection as well. Now, I think the key is to knowing what will best serve the Lord's purposes. And for that, we always need to seek for His wisdom through prayer and through the Word of God. So we see Paul use wisdom to get out of this flogging, which really would have served no purpose in this case. Now we see, secondly, this wisdom applied when Paul was before the Sanhedrin. Now remember, the tribune still has no idea why the Jews reacted as they did. We're going to see a little bit later that, that the Lysias, I believe the guy's name is, who is the tribune, needs to find out so he can know what it is they had against him that he might inform his superiors. So, seeking to discover the, the cause, he ordered the Jews to convene their council, the Sanhedrin, and brought Paul before them to see what they had to say. Now, it is interesting. The last time Paul was before this council was when he was casting his vote against Stephen to have him put to death. And now Paul stands before the council again by God's grace in order to defend what it is that Stephen had actually died for. Well, Paul begins by declaring his innocence. Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. Now, Paul does not mean by this that he was sinless, but what he meant was that he was not the apostate from the Jewish faith that they considered him to be. Now, when he had said this, Ananias commanded those who stood next to him to strike him on the mouth, which essentially means to slap him on the face, 
which was an insult, it was degrading, in order to silence him. Gill tells us this was an act of contempt. For a judge to treat a prisoner in this way for declaring his innocence was contrary to both Jewish and Roman law. And so Paul responds, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Now again, as we read this text, we think, okay, was, was Paul really on the right track here? I mean, some people look at Paul and they say, he, he lost his temper. This was an act of indiscretion. I don't think that was the case. It might better be seen as prophetic. This is basically an imprecation against Ananias. And Josephus tells us that this Ananias was killed by an assassin during the Jewish war. The Jewish war took place during AD 70, which is what we're looking at in the evenings. When God brings his judgment against the Jews for crucifying the, their Messiah, God actually did strike Ananias down for his wickedness. When Paul calls him a whitewashed wall, what he's referring to, of course, is his, his hypocrisy in this case. In verse 3, do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? You know, if you're going to judge me, you need to be doing things orderly according to the law. Now, what Paul was saying about him was essentially the same thing that Jesus said about the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 27, and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So Ananias was sitting in judgment of Paul, seeking to portray himself as a righteous man, but yet contrary to the law, he ordered him to be struck, which showed his malice. Now, Ananias was clearly wrong, but interestingly, so was Paul. But only because of ignorance, one of the bystanders said to him, do you revile God's high priest? Paul did not know that Ananias was the high priest, but when he heard, he immediately repented. Okay? He says, I was not aware, brethren, that he was high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, I want you to notice again, this was done in ignorance, and when Paul discovered that he had done something that was inappropriate, he immediately repented, and this is what our Lord tells us, defines somebody who is a true believer, who loves the Lord. When they find that they do something that is dishonoring to him, they immediately turn from that, and they begin to go the right way direction. But I think there's another important lesson for us here, particularly in our political climate. Even though someone is wicked, as Ananias was, and worthy to be censored, I think that what Paul said to him was appropriate as far as the person was concerned, they are still to be honored for the office that they hold. And he had this office, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, how appropriate is that for the present time? You know, sadly, we have so many government leaders who seem to make it their primary business to promote the things that God hates. And there have likely been times when we have called them out publicly, maybe not to their faces, but maybe to, to one another in a way that doesn't show them the honor that their office deserves. We need to be careful that we don't speak evil of our rulers. Not that what they're doing isn't wrong. We need to speak, I think, the truth about what they're doing, that it's contrary to God's law, but we need to be careful about what we say about them. We do need to pray for them, that God would bring them to repentance and faith. And I think this is simply another way of loving our enemies. They are enemies of the gospel, but we still need to pray for them, that God would turn them and that God would allow them, or, or actually allow us, to live as he would call us to live even under their rule. Now, finally, seeing the direction that this hearing was going and wanting to show the tribune, I think, the true character of this council, Paul, knowing that the Lord was working through all of these things to bring him to Rome and that he had already testified of God's grace before these same people. These are the, you know, again, these are the ones who exploded when he was trying to explain to them. 
uh, why he was there in the temple, that he had not abandoned his people, that they should receive their Messiah. But he cries out this, which was, was really calculated to stop the proceedings. He says, brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. Now, Paul knew what this was going to do, and it did. It immediately divided the council. The Sadduc- he, he noted that there were both Sadducees and Pharisees. Now, the Sadducees were the theological liberals of the day. They were like you know, the liberals that we understand in, in Christian circles. They deny anything beyond this life, anything you can see. They deny the resurrection, angels, spirits, life after death. Sadducees denied all these things, but the Pharisees believed all of these things. And some of the scribes among the Pharisees saw this as an opportunity to put the Sadducees in their place, and so they immediately closed ranks with Paul. We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel had spoken to him. Can, can they honestly say they found nothing wrong with him? Well, we see what, you know, again, what co-belligerency can bring about when you have a common enemy. It causes you to close ranks. Now, I think that there are some issues that can cause even the most diverse groups to close ranks. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but the first time I had to think about it, it was a little bit shocking to me. Is it wrong for Protestants to close ranks with Catholics and even Mormons on issues that we view as common enemies, such as abortion? I I don't think so, if we have a common enemy. But we do need to make sure that that the world understands when we close ranks with them. We're not closing ranks with them as brethren. It's just that we have a common enemy. We all believe this is wrong, and so we stand against it. But we are not of the same faith. Now, the battle between the two groups became so violent that the tribune ordered his men to take Paul back to the barracks. Again, Paul was protected. And that night the Lord stood by Paul and said to him, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. And again, the Lord is saying to him, You've been faithful in in testifying here. I'm going to send you next to Rome where you will do the same thing. So the Lord delivers him. The Lord was his protection, the shade on his right hand, because he trusted in the Lord The Lord brought him through. As we've seen before, it doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer. You know, there's going to be very difficult situations and perhaps we will suffer quite a bit. But the Lord will protect us to the end. Now, one thing we might wonder is if we serve the Lord in this way and run into a situation, maybe similar circumstances, can we have this same kind of wisdom, this same kind of shrewdness that, that Paul had, that Jesus said to his disciples that they should have. Well, I believe that James tells us we can. He says in the first chapter of his letter in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But James also goes on to say, But he must ask in faith without any doubting. We must trust that God will give to us this wisdom, and if we do, He will. And if God will give us this wisdom, then we really don't need to be afraid, do we, of these types of circumstances, and we can be more open with sharing the gospel. Well, may the Lord um, help us to receive this and, and to apply it to our lives, that we might be changed and a little bit more changed into the image of Christ, that we might grow into his image. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and then let's prepare to come to the table.